You asked me where my parents' bedroom was. You haven't shed one tear for your family. You were totally unemotional about this. You walk into a house, your whole family's murdered. You know what? You're under arrest. Okay. Four counts of first degree murder. Sit down. Mm -hmm. Sit down. Okay. On February 1st, 2008, 15-year-old Nicholas Browning massacred his entire family. Parents 45-year-old John and 44-year-old Tamara Browning, along with his two younger brothers, 13-year-old Gregory and 11-year-old Benjamin, were shot as they slept. Nicholas had spent the night at a friend's house, but in the early hours of the next day, he drove to his family home, shot and killed all four family members, then drove back to his sleepover as if nothing happened. Later in the day that Saturday afternoon, Nicholas and his friends entered his family home and discovered the deceased bodies. Nicholas, along with his friends at the sleepover, Ryan, Taylor, and Alexander were all interrogated separately about the events that night. In this video, I'm going to go over some of the key elements of their interrogations. So this true crime is one that completely blew my mind for the simple fact that we're talking about a child, a 15 year old killing their entire family in one night. The fact that he was able to do this and then go back to the sleepover as if nothing happened is mind blowing to me. I've never in my life seen someone so young commit such a heinous crime and not be bothered by it. So the interrogation starts with the officers separating each of the boys that were at the sleepover because they wanna find out what they know, if their stories are gonna be contradictory to each other, or if they're going to complement one another in telling the truth. So the way this scene sets up, Nicholas and his friends were at the mall shopping the very next day after these crimes were committed. Of course, at this point in time, nobody knew what had happened other than Nicholas. They're at the mall, and then they head over to Nicholas's house. Now, when they got to Nicholas's house, they realized right away that the door had been unlocked, and it looked like a burglary had happened, which is something that Nicholas did on purpose because he wanted to set the stage for somebody breaking in and killing his entire family. He knew once they walked in what they were about to see. They first saw Nicholas's father, John, dead on the couch. The boys run outside to go get Ryan's father, who just dropped them off at the house. Ryan's father runs inside with them and discovers covers this gruesome scene of John dead on the couch, all bloodied up. Ryan's dad and the rest of them look around the house and they find his mom deceased in her room, followed by his younger brothers also deceased in their rooms. So in the interrogation, the boys describe what seems like a pretty normal night for a sleepover. Yes, all right, good. Thanks for coming around here, Nicholas. Mm -hmm. It's kind of been a long day. I'll just need some basic information from each Ryan, right? Yes. I'm a homicide detective. Mm -hmm. Some bad stuff has happened tonight. Mm -hmm. I need you to be 100% honest with me. All right. I want you to tell me what's been going on and explain. What, what, who were you with all day? I was with uh, uh, Ryan, mm -hmm. Alex, and Nick. They were watching movies on Netflix. They were playing video games. Uh, video games, basically. Watching movies. Uh, I remember we were watching, we were watching Robin Big at first. And then we were looking through the movies. Oh, accepted. We're watching accepted. Around, we started that around like 10:15 or something. Around 10:15 last night. Yeah. I, don't know, I fell asleep like halfway through it. So, uh, and then. Where, where were you guys at? In part of the house? Where were you guys at? In like the living room, the main room, family room, I guess you want to call it. You guys spent the entire evening together yesterday. Yes. Did you actually leave the house at all last night? Um, we just walk around the neighborhood. Okay. How far do you live from where he lives? Um, uh, half a mile. Half a mile. Did you guys go over there? No. Did he? Yes. What time did he go over there? Um, like 12.30. Last night? Yes. What are you going home for? Um, truthfully, we were going to just take his car out. I'm sorry, what was his name? Nick Browning. Now keep in mind that Ryan just said that his house is relatively only about a half a mile away from Nicholas's house. Now this is going to be extremely important to remember because something else happens in this interrogation that does not make any sense. Let's keep watching. Just take his car out for a little drive. Okay. Did you guys do that? No. All of you were there? Yes. Okay. Nick said that he was there. He's, he's, that when he got there, the lights were still on. Okay. And so he just went in the car um, and, the, just, and he said he fell asleep. So according to the boys, the whole plan was supposed to be that around 1230, Nicholas decided to go back to his house to steal the family car so that they can go joyriding throughout the night. That was the plan. But when Nicholas got there, he told the other boys that the lights were on and something seemed off. And then at around 1.30, stupid me, I went back to my house to try to get the car. The keys were um, 
when my parents were at the lights were on in the house. Now, according to Nicholas's story, he wasn't sure when he got to the driveway if the lights were still on because his parents were still up and he was afraid of them hearing him with the car and then getting caught. Or the other possibility in Nicholas's mind is that maybe there was an intruder in the house. But the story just doesn't make any sense because how many intruders do you know are going to leave the lights on while they're robbing a house at 12.30 at night? Now a major problem with this story is that Nicholas claims what he told his friends is that while he was waiting in his car for the lights to go down, he accidentally just fell asleep for a couple of hours. Now here's the thing, if you know you're sneaking to your parents' house to steal the family car, you're gonna have pretty high adrenaline and the last thing you're gonna wanna do is go to sleep. That's number one. Number two, Two, if somebody was intruding in the house, which is what he claims must have happened, wouldn't he have heard or saw something happen while he was in the driveway? Also, why wouldn't he just call for help if something bad was happening in his mind? But he did none of that. Instead, he just went to sleep while a supposed intruder was in the house possibly robbing the family. Does that make any sense to you? Would you not get out of the car, run to a neighbor's house, ask for help if you were afraid that somebody was in your house harming your family? But instead, Nicholas went to sleep. First red flag. And like three hours later, or how many hours later, he, Alex called him and see where he was. He's like, oh, I fell asleep in the car. And then he came back to my house. What bed did you go to? I went into his brother Joe's, his brother's room. And then... Uh, was Joe there? Joe, no, he was not there. Where was he? He was at a friend's house. Okay. So you went in Joe's room? Yeah, and then the singles, or the parents had friends over, and they they were, they were weren't going to sleep there, then they did. The friends so, of the singles did? Yeah, the, their friends, so they um came in Joe's room to sleep, so I had to get up. Went down to the basement and slept on the futon. <laughs> Now this section is pretty important because as Taylor is telling his story, he's being very, very detailed, which is a telltale sign that somebody is telling the truth. See, when a person is lying, they tend to not be as specific as possible because they don't want to get caught in a later lie if they contradict themselves. What time was that about, you remember? I don't know what time that was. It was probably like 1.30 1 maybe. When um, you woke up to go to Joe's room, where were all the other boys? Sleeping on the couch next to me and up in his room. Okay. Uh, was Nick there? Yes. You sure? Um, That's real important. No, I don't think he was. Okay. Actually, yeah, no. He wasn't there. He went out, I okay. think. Now, mind you, Nicholas, according to Ryan, left Ryan's house at 1230 to go get his car. Now, Taylor just said that when he moved from one room to the other, it was around 1 o'clock or 1.30. And when the detective asked him, was Nicholas there, knowing that he wasn't, Taylor lies and says, yeah, he was there. I, I don't Taylor, know. I want to tell you now. Yes. This is a murder case. Yes. You're 15 years old. Yes. You cannot lie to me. All right. Because you will go to jail for the rest of your life. Okay. Nick was not in there? No. Do you know that he left? What? Do you know that he left? I mean, yeah, I guess because I didn't see him there. I didn't know he was leaving. Okay. Are you sure you've been 100% honest? Is there something you should be telling me? Because I'm not telling you how, how important this is right now. Uh... There's something you think? Actually, he, he did. He told me that he was going to go out, but he didn't tell me where he really was going. He just told me he was going. He gonna, might, might take the car. He went did he there. say where he was going to go with the car? No, he did not. He said he was going to. And next thing I, I knew it, I mean, woke up. Mm -hmm. And he said fell asleep or whatever. Okay. So he said fell asleep in his car. And he came, then he walked, walked back, I guess, or biked. I, I don't know which one he did. Okay. And that's... Okay. I'm going to let you think for a little bit, and I'm going to come back in and talk to you, okay? All right. Then I get a call from Alex around, I think, 5 in the morning. Okay. And then I wake, he wakes me up, and then you know, I slept in the car, and the lights are still in the house. Okay. And it, it doesn't make sense now, but, you okay. know. So what did you do that? I walked back in. Okay. Just like, yeah, it's, it's 5 in the morning. Okay. It's, did, did you walk back to Ryan's yeah, house? That and yeah. I got there. How far is it? It's, it's a hike. It's probably yeah. like a 20 minute walk. He said he was going to leave at 12.45. What were you guys going to do? Just um, drive around? Yeah, or? just drive around. Do you have anybody to go visit girls or anything like that? No, they were just going to drive around. Okay. What happened after that? Well, I fell asleep around 1. Okay. And then... You stayed in, you stayed in that living Yes, way? and then I woke up around 5. And I called Nick to see where he was because he didn't. He said he was gonna come back and wake me up when he had the car, but okay. he never called. So I called him. He said he was walking back to Ryan's and 
he was lost and I told him how to get him. Now this is why I mentioned earlier the distance between Ryan's house and Nicholas's house. Cause we just heard Alex say that when he spoke to Nicholas on the phone, that Nick told him he was lost. And Alex was trying to explain to him how to get back to Ryan's house. And that's why it was taking him so long. Now mind you, the distance between their houses are about half a mile. I'm sure Nicholas has been to Ryan's house more than a dozen times since they are close friends and they're at a sleepover. So it makes no sense that Nicholas suddenly doesn't know how to get back to his best friend's house, a house that he's been at multiple times, a house that is only about a half a mile away. That right there should have been a huge red flag for Alex. Now, I don't know if Alex is lying and trying to cover for his friend or if he truly thought that Nicholas was lost. But if so, it just doesn't add up. That will happen. What you Alright, we went upstairs. We just, we ate breakfast or lunch. 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 And then, let's see, uh, Nick went upstairs to take a shower. And then, what happened? Uh, when Mr. Pat came, um, see, Alex drove us back to Nick's house because we were going to be there for the night. And he went inside. I don't know, like, when we were waiting, he was worried because yeah. Nick, because you know, he said, he was like, he was calling him like all morning. So he started calling him at like 11. And um, he was like worried. He kept on calling, like all the phones, leaving messages. And no one picked up. I called my parents all day and they hadn't picked up. So. From the cell phone? So originally from Ryan's house phone and then my phone a bunch of times. Me, Taylor, Nick, and Alex were at the mall. We came home. Um, Mr. Pat drove us to Nick's house because we we're going to be there tonight because they were all at my house last night. So you guys get to back home. What happened then? Then I opened the garage door. I walk inside. How did you open the garage door? How do you do that? Tell the code. Is there, oh, okay. For the outdoor, outdoor code. Right. The keypad. Garage door opens or something? Right. Okay. And so I walked inside um, and then the door's unlocked, which is weird because one of my parents locked the door. Which door? The, the door in the... door into the garage. Kitchen? Into the kitchen. Okay, from the garage to the kitchen. That was locked. So I figured it would be locked, but it wasn't. So. I walked in okay. and I saw my father on the couch and that's sort of okay. What did you see about that? I know stuff, but what did you see? I saw he was on the couch and there was um, blood on the face. Now mind you, Nicholas is describing seeing his father, the man who <laughs> raised him his whole life, dead, dead on the couch with blood everywhere, shot and killed. And he's talking about it like he's describing seeing a piece of gum on the ground. No emotion, no feelings, no hesitation. He's just talking about it nonchalantly. No normal person, regardless of age, is going to describe that scene without being bothered, without being emotional, without being traumatized. But Nicholas is showing none of those signs. What did you do after that? Um, then we talked to Mr. Smith and he came in the house. And okay. He called 911 and I went upstairs the first of my mother and my two brothers. I saw them. Okay discovered his dad on the couch, like bloody, his face was really pale. And then we got Mr. Pat, who's about to drive away. He came in and then he pushed us away from like the dad. So Nick went upstairs, found his mom in the master bedroom and the, his two brothers in their bedroom, like all bloody. And I was, I, I was up there too with him. And Alex was down the hall and I just took Nick and just brought him outside. Okay. I just stayed right by the stairs when you walk in. I didn't yeah. want to. I didn't want to see anything. Okay. And Nick just said he saw blood on him. Okay. And then, right as my dad was pulling off, I stopped him. Did you see his dad or anything? Yeah, I saw him on the couch. So I ran outside and got Mr. Smith. Okay. And uh, he came in. And he was like yelling. He's like, yeah. John, 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 are you okay? And um, so I gave Mr. Pat the home phone mm -hmm. and he called me on one one. And Nick went upstairs and looked in his brother's and mom's room and they were, had like blood on them. I can't imagine how traumatizing that would be if I was a friend of Nick's and I went to his home and his entire family is dead, bloodied everywhere. I mean, how do you even comprehend that? It's shocking to me how calm his friends are as they're describing what they saw. Cause I know that if it was me, I would be a wreck. I would be a complete wreck. And I don't know if they're trying to save face to protect Nick or if maybe they're just in shock. I'm not quite sure, but I do find it interesting that they're able to speak about this with very little emotion. We know why Nick isn't showing any emotion. He's a sociopath. We went. We all ran out of bed. What you see back there? We were going to see if there's anything, any signs down there. So he opened the door and he saw the Xbox and his. Who's he? Nick. 
Okay. He saw the Xbox and the Wii like on the top of each other on the pool table. They saw the Xbox and the Wii on top of the pool table. Now, Nick's story is that his house must have been burglarized, that somebody came, they stole their stuff and killed the entire family. But if the burglary theory is correct, wouldn't they have taken the Wii and the Xbox as well? Why would that still be sitting there on top of a pool table, untouched? Now, did Nick ever, did he tell you he had driven around at all last night? Nah, he said he didn't at all. Okay. But then today at the mall, he said he couldn't get the keys and he pulls the car keys out of this jacket. And he oh, said they, they just, he said they were just in there, he didn't even know. In his pocket? Yeah, in his jacket pocket. Okay. Nick had earlier said that he wasn't able to get the keys or go inside the house. But now Alex's story completely contradicts what Nick said. So did you ever get inside the keys at all or? No, I was on that car, but never inside the house. Okay, okay. All right, let me work on that real quick. Okay. And I'll come back and talk to him a little bit, okay? okay. You need anything else? Some food would be nice. Some food is it? Um, Check our restaurant here. It's, it's all we eat junk food here. Is that okay? It's fine. How about some drink? Uh, soda would be great. If I had just found out that my family was massacred, the last thing on my mind would be eating fast food or eating anything for that matter. The way that he's behaving, his lack of emotion, and now asking for food? In what universe is this behavior normal? Now watch as Nick receives his food and lounges around, enjoying his meal, and then once he's done, chillaxes. All right. The detective leaves him alone to eat the food he requested. After everything that's happened to his parents and brothers, Nick is able to eat a burger and fries. After he's done eating, Nick moves to a different chair and lays down with his feet up. This shows he feels at ease and relaxed, which is abnormal. It also shows a disrespect for authority. Alex and Taylor then confirmed that Nick had actually spoke to his brother Gregory and told him to keep the basement door unlocked. I remember Nick told his little brothers how he was going to get in to keep the basement door unlocked. That's how he was going to get in the Did keys. he call his little brother? Yeah, he called him. And that's how he was going to get in the house? Yes. The basement door? Yeah, the slider. No. The, like where the pool table was that kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, yeah. That, that's wrong for me. I should remember that. That's cool. Thank you. Do you remember at one point Nick calling his uh, little brother? Yeah, he called his brother. What did he tell him? What did he ask him? To know they didn't pick up. How about before that? Did he get a hold of his brother and say, leave the back door open? Yes. Okay. He did. All right, that's the stuff, man. You can't, you can't keep doing that to me. You gotta be 100% true with me. All right? Yes. Alex revealing that at some point in time in the night, Nicholas actually called his younger brother and told him to leave the basement door unlocked is crucial because that explains how Nicholas was able to get inside the house to kill his family. At this point, the detective knows that Nicholas's story has way too many holes in it and the jig is up. And at this point in time, he and his partner decide to confront Nicholas about what they know and the fact that they know that he is responsible for these murders. Hey Nick, this is my partner. Hi, nice to meet you. I've been a cop a long time. I'm in homicide, I've been here a while. Stuff's just not adding up for me right now with you, okay? I think you had something to do with what happened tonight. I think that you killed your family. And the thing is, the more you lie, the deeper it gets. There's gotta be a reason why you did this. Nobody broke into the house last night. Didn't kill them. Yeah, it had to be you. Nobody else did this. You know where we found the keys for the gun locker? Where? You tell me, you know where they are. We searched the house? Yeah, you do. They're under your mattress, in your room. According to Nicholas, he and his father had a very tumultuous relationship. He was really strict on Nicholas and hard on Nicholas, and obviously Nick had a problem with that. Now, we don't know if it teetered on abuse because there are a lot of strict parents, and how do you determine what is just being a strict parent versus being an abusive parent? That we would never know because obviously John and Tamara are no longer here to confirm or deny any of these claims. But what we do know is that Nicholas has shown very little empathy or sorrow for what he did. The fact that he hid the keys to the gun cabinet underneath his bed and they found that was crucial. Because why would you hide those keys if you had nothing to do with this? Why would they magically be under your bed? On the right side of the bed. Nobody you put them there. Nobody broke into this house. You went into that house. You called and had your brother leave the door open. There's no other explanation. Yes, you did. You did. 
And the more you lie, the deeper it's going to get for you. Eventually, Nicholas realizes that his story is not going to be bought by these detectives, and he finally, finally cracks and decides to just tell the truth. I've been to plenty of burglaries. I know what a burglar looks like. And you all can know how many houses have been burglarized. This your house wasn't burglarized. This was no burglar. Nobody broke in. Nobody went in there and killed the, your family. You did it. He did. And you know, he did case and he had one note called huge physical beating, but I think he's he still uncalled for. The emotional, I think. And then on Friday night, he was, he was just mad. I don't really know why he was mad. What happened? I walked up. I sat there for a half hour. Just, he was sleeping? Yeah. Standing over him. And then I, I went between putting the gun up to his head and pulling it back down and up. Do you have a pillow up too? Or? Yeah, just the gun. The gun was... And I'm not sure if I meant to pull the trigger or if it just... Well. It just and then once that happened, I freaked out, but and I thought, you know, they'd all come down, but... I don't even know if they woke up or whatever, but so I sat on the couch and they were up and I just I couldn't I realize I couldn't just walk away from that. And then I shot my mom. And then She's still sleeping? Yeah. I waited for a little bit then I think she went back to sleep. Mm -hmm. I shot her and I shot her and back. Why the brothers, man? I was, I didn't, I thought if no one was there to um, say anything that my story would go because it was the only one. I just got scared. The details don't seem real. I can't believe you did that. Thank you. It's, it's such a shock. Like, I can't even, it's not, I know, it's not even sinking in. It's such a shock. I, and it was all planned. I like, mean, I don't get that. It doesn't make any sense. These young ladies asked us not to reveal their names, but they shared with ABC2 News what they know about Nicholas Browning. He was on the golf team and a student in the gifted and talented classes at Delaney High School. He's only 15. Nick Browning Jr. wept as a prosecutor read chilling details of how he murdered his parents and his two younger brothers as they slept. It happened February 2nd inside the family home in Cockeysville. Browning pleaded guilty to four counts of murder in exchange for parole, following two consecutive life prison terms. Prosecutors had sought four life sentences without the possibility of parole. Browning was 15 when he shot his family, just one week shy of his 16th birthday. His parents dropped him off at a friend's house. Browning told his buddies he would go back to his house and take the family car so they could all drive around. He asked his brother Gregory to leave the basement door unlocked. Browning retrieved a 9mm pistol his father had been cleaning from a work area in the basement. His two younger brothers were asleep down the hall. He shot 14-year-old Gregory once in the head. 11-year-old Benjamin began to stir. Browning shot him twice in the face. One of the bullets grazed Benjamin's left index finger as he put his hand over his face prior to being shot. Did your brothers ever wake up? Were they awake? I think so. Nick was eventually convicted of killing his entire family and was sentenced to four life terms. Two of those were run consecutively, which gives him a chance to be paroled in 23 years. In my opinion, this person is a clear sociopath. He does not show any signs of remorse. In fact, he's even on a pen pal list in prison where he gets to talk to people and it's almost like he's making a Facebook profile for himself. Nicholas Browning is currently serving a double life sentence for shooting his parents and brothers to death four years ago. Now he is featured on a controversial website soliciting pen pals. Now 19 and serving a double life sentence, he's peeling back layers of his personality via a website called goodprisoner.com. His profile reads Nick Browning, Taurus, convicted of homicide, multiple counts. Browning's page delves into his sexual preferences and implores strangers to write to him, saying, quote, I have a long road ahead of me, and I would love to have someone to talk to through this expletive journey of mine. All things considered, I'm still upbeat about life, despite my bleak surroundings. I love to have fun. If nothing else, I have an interesting story to tell. 
Someone from my background generally doesn't end up in prison. When asked if he has siblings, a simple none. Only time will tell what's gonna happen with Nicholas Browning. Will he be released one day? We just don't know, but we are definitely watching and we'll see what happens. If you enjoy this content and you wanna see more, please do not forget to like, comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm also available on TikTok and on Instagram under Curly Boy Chuck. Until next time, peace.